Hey everyone, and welcome to the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. On this episode, we're going to be diving into episodes 414 through 416, which will cover manga chapters 519 through 522. And yeah, so this episode is going to be discussing some pretty heavy subjects with the always controversial character of Boa Hancock as we dive deep into her backstory. So synopsis, after Luffy's victory over the Boa sisters, his sacrifice to protect their secret earns him an audience with Hancock as she opens up to him and reveals her and her sister's dark past with the Celestial Dragons. After earning her trust, Luffy is welcomed into Amazon Lily as a guest, but soon learns that something far more pressing than even getting back to his crew needs his immediate attention. Alrighty, so differences. The big one is basically the beginning of episode 414 is all filler. As in, like I mentioned in the last podcast, he's immediately supposed to go into gear second. And obviously the reason why he didn't do that at the end of the last episode is because they wanted to give themselves a lot of room. And it's basically just to fill time. And so... He does a a little bit more fighting. Almost the entire first half of the episode is just uh, filler until he actually goes into gear second. Next difference is the conversation about inviting Luffy to the banquet was added. As in the manga, it just cuts from Hancock tearfully saying that she will give Luffy a ride. And then it immediately cuts to the banquet scene. But in the anime, we get this sort of conversation about whether they should even uh, invite him. And all of that. And speaking of the banquet scene, this is also extended quite a bit as well in the anime, because there's this sort of added tension of the ladies in the um the banquet being a little wary of Luffy's presence and even kind of grossed out by Luffy's impolite manners. And then there's this whole subplot of them thinking that this is some sort of a test by Hancock. But in the manga, the banquet it immediately starts off as a party with Luffy doing his famous chopstick nose and dancing on the table. And so there's not really this sort of tension built up in the manga. It's just straight up party time. And then finally, we see Hancock kind of faint from her illness in the anime as she's kind of looking over her balcony and drops the, the wine glass. Whereas in the anime, we do actually don't see uh, Hancock again until she's already in bed when Luffy and Yon Granny go to ask her about maybe being able to take him to the Impel Downs. Those are pretty much the major ones. There's a couple more added scenes during, obviously during the flashback um, of Boa's or uh, uh, Boa Hancock's story. And so, yeah, th- I mean, I don't really call those differences. They're just sort of just added scenes to enhance that. Okay, so let's get into these episodes. Now, this is going to be potentially a longer episode, so let's begin. Episode 414 is pretty much an exercise in how much time they can possibly waste, as most of this episode is additional filler, like I was saying, delaying Luffy from progressing the fight by going into gear second. Of course, like I mentioned in the podcast Normally, what was supposed to happen is that he goes straight into gear second from the point that the episode ended, the last episode that is, but it takes more than half an episode for it to finally get get him to gear second. I still love that running joke where they attribute everything men can do with what Luffy specifically can do, and they even have this sort of researcher taking notes, noting that men can emit steam out of their body, which no one else in One Piece can do other than Luffy, at least as far as we know. And afterwards, they're going to have a very skewed view of the capabilities of all men, and they're going to be sorely disappointed with the average man if they're comparing them to Luffy. But yeah, finally, we get we get to the good stuff as Luffy does go gear second and we see that Haki isn't invincible. Un- you know, unlike his fight with NL though, Luffy doesn't have to mask his attacks anymore. Even with gear second's extreme speed, he can just straight up beat their predictive skills and just act faster than they can react to the predict the prediction that they can see or even faster than they can react. And so it's a huge step up in terms of his ability when you straight up compare his fight to the these Boa sisters in, in Mary Gold and Sandra Sonia to NL. Because, yeah, as we remember with NL, Luffy 
while he could still hit NL, he had to kind of mask his attacks by either deflect them, deflecting them off of things or just straight up trying to trick NL. Here, Luffy re- like acts so quickly that even if they can see what's coming, they can't react to it, which is a pretty cool uh, evolution in terms of Luffy seeing where he's come from fighting NL to, to the sisters. The other thing that's often overlooked, even by me, because we focus on the power, is Luffy's strategy has also shifted here. Like, because of the defensive capabilities of Haki, has shown Luffy isn't trying to beat them down, but more so immobilize them and knock them off balance. Luffy then wins probably one of the most, in probably one of the most Luffy fashion, using his creativity, he throws them off balance and then ties their tails together. But in the chaos of the end of the battle, Sandersonia is left hanging off of the moat of blades with her top shirt burnt off due to Marigold's fire, and it risks exposing whatever the three are hiding on their backs. Of course, we will later go on to learn that these are the brands of the Celestial Dragon, signifying that they were once slaves. And if found out by the rest of the island, they would no longer be welcomed on Amazon Lily and be forced to flee. But we'll get more into that uh, in a bit. And this is one of my favorite moments of Amazon Lily, and maybe even the, one of the you know series highlights as well, because it is such a touching moment, and it not only makes you love Luffy more, but it really humanizes the three Boa sisters who just a moment ago you kind of hated due to their arrogance. And it reinforces that theme of simple acts of kindness and compassion, even to someone that was your enemy, can go a long way. And there is one other very important skill that Luffy has that allows him to know when to show compassion and kindness because we know that Luffy isn't this kind and compassionate towards all his enemies or adversaries. Some of them he just knows he needs to beat them senseless. And yeah, this skill obviously I'm referring to, of course, we've talked about in the past many times, is his incredible emotional and social intelligence. Like His ability to read and connect to people is unmatched and he can innately and instinctively tell what kind of a person they are and here despite you know them being annoying and trying to kill them he knows that they're not doing this because they're necessarily evil but because of some misguided reasons and mainly Luffy clearly sees through what everyone else can't or refuses to see especially when it comes to Hancock like he can see beyond the beauty as we see in later, you know, later in these episodes, that this sort of hard and cold and cruel persona that Hancock shows is a mask. But as we've seen, Luffy, he, you know, he sees right past that and sees her actions as nothing more than annoying and mean. And as we saw, this shocks Hancock because based on what we've seen, it seems apart from young granny and her sisters, no one ever talks to her like that to the point where, yeah, Luffy just straight up calls her annoying and and even calls her out on her sort of more cold and cruel nature. And like always, Luffy doesn't see any reason to fight any longer when the fight is clearly over. And to some extent, he, he even sh- extends this to those, you know, said quote unquote evil villains Luffy does show them some level of compassion as we've never seen Luffy go for a fatal blow on anyone, no matter how terrible of a person they are. You know, we saw Crocodile and NL, like two of probably the more evil people, and he still doesn't actually kill them. You know, once they're incapacitated, the fights are done in Luffy's mind and there's no reason to finish anyone off. And will even go out of his way to perhaps even save them like he did with Robin in the ruins of Arabasta. And I haven't even gotten to the biggest moment I think of this episode is just how emotional Hancock becomes despite her hard and cold persona that she has put on so far. Something about Luffy's act here has shaken her to her core and she starts to tear up immensely to the point where she still tries to hide it under her hand. But you see just how much this act meant to her. However, she's still not able to let her guard down and has one more cruel test she wants to put Luffy through. But more so because uh, of her cynical views on men in general. But this view, we will go on to see, is pretty justified based on what, you know, these three have endured in their past at the hands of men. 
Hancock gives Luffy seeming, a seemingly impossible choice. She'll grant one request for, for Luffy either save Margaret, Sweet Pea, and Ephelandra, or a ship that will take him back to his crew. Hancock is convinced all men are selfish and cruel people and will choose to forsake the three women for his own selfish desires. She's testing him because she's convinced that perhaps he's acting nice just to get something out of her. So she makes him choose between them. But then we get possibly one of the more emotionally impactful moments of the series for me. Luffy, with no hint of an ulterior motive, just immediately gets down on his knees and thanks her for saving the three without even contemplating the other option to the absolute shock of everyone. To them, it's inconceivable that men like this would exist based on all their past experiences with them, as we'll go on to see. And symbolically, this moment is also huge from the point of view of us as well as the Boa sisters, because for someone of the caliber of Luffy who possesses Conqueror's Haki, basically a conqueror, to get on his knees and bow his head on the ground is no small thing, especially in Japanese culture. Bowing with your head on the ground, lowering yourself as low as possible to signify deference to someone is huge. It can sometimes be seen as beneath someone to be seen bowing like this in the, the dogeza pose. Because usually you see this when people are ashamed or asking for forgiveness or they're begging for some someone or something. And so for someone as powerful as Luffy to take this pose is pretty significant. Not only that, but, you know, from a One Piece perspective, we also see Luffy just lets his prized treasure, the straw hat, just hit the ground with no regard for it. And he doesn't stop to take it off and then bow. He just immediately goes to bow and, and it just hits the ground, just like it does when he first learns of this lesson from Vivi back on drum when he confronted Dalton and how he asked him for his help in, in terms of Nami's illness. And I love that this kind of mirrors that very same situation. And also showing that while the straw hat is his treasure and an extremely important thing to, to Luffy, it's still not worth the other people's lives. Like, I, I also really like that distinction. Is that, yeah, the straw hat is important, but it's not nearly as important as another person's life. And also, can we just also talk about the... The positivity of how Luffy is just grinning and laughing the whole time because of how happy he is that his saviors will be saved now. And I think also, you know, it was easy for Luffy to choose that decision because even if Hancock wasn't going to help him get off the island, he'd figure some way off. But he knew for a fact that the only person that could save the three of them was Hancock. We also get a glimpse in that brief flashback that Hancock not only forgives the three women, but also her icy coldness drops for a split second as she encourages the three with a bit of warmth in, in her voice, which doesn't seem to be lost on Sandra, Sonia, and Marigold either. And it never goes completely away, though, as she seems determined to keep her guard up, as we'll soon see why she does that. Luffy is invited back to the castle. Well, it is funny that, I, like I mentioned, the only thing on Luffy's mind right now is to get back to his nakama and food. So even when he sees Hancock in the nude again, he doesn't even care. And she's a little miffed at this because she was clearly trying to get a reaction out of Luffy because she's still trying to test him to make sure, like, because she is so weary of men that she keeps you know, trying to sort of weed out what kind of person really is Luffy. But I think I think she's at this point starting to realize that Luffy is genuinely like this. Like, he's not putting on a facade. He's not trying to do any of this with an ulterior motive. So, yeah, we're about to get into Hancock's past. Now, just as a warning, we are going to get into some really heavy and potentially triggering subject material as... We get into Hancock's past, and so if, if you know, particularly when it comes to abuse towards women, I think, yeah, if you would, if you want to, you can skip ahead, and I'm going to try and create chapters in this podcast so that it is easier to sp skip to exactly when I go back to talking about the story. So yeah, let's begin. So it's here we get to the big reveal. And if you thought the slavery and human trafficking story of Sabodi was dark, 
Oda takes it to a whole new level of dark, to possibly the darkest place the series goes into overall. I, I don't know that it ever go, gets this dark, but what I have to believe is an, is an allusion to sex trafficking of minors now. And Hancock shows Luffy her, her back, and it is a tattoo of sorts, but we'll go on to learn that it's it's so much worse than a tattoo, but a brand and that's been burned into her skin. And it is, however, slightly different from Hachi's as it looks like a claw more so than a sun. Oda tells this part of the story so well through his characters and visuals, and you can tell the pain in Sandra Sonia's face. Like, Nyon Granny then shows up and wants to help Hancock by getting her to finally open up to someone and that Luffy is the person she can put her trust in by revealing that Luffy punched a celestial dragon. Now, of course, to anyone, this revelation would be shocking, but this action holds a great deal more of weight and meaning to Hancock and her sisters, to to a degree that I wasn't prepared for. This whole section was a really pow- powerful moment, and everything that Oda has been building up surrounding the celestial dragons has been basically leading to this reveal, I feel like. I can't... You know, I can't tell you how many, like, chills I got reading this. The way it slowly has Hancock revealing her true self as she learns more about Luffy and the more she's able to open up is incredible. Especially how she says there's there are still such foolish people out there in this world as she trembles with tears in her eyes, remarking that, yeah, there aren't very many people that will stand up to a celestial dragon except for the person that who ended up saving her. And we learn that the mark is of the Celestial Dragons, and specifically that, that it's the mark of being a slave to a Celestial Dragon. Like, the pain on display here, and the voice acting, is palpable. Like, a Shichibukai was once a slave is pretty wild to think about. Because up till now, these people have been, like, the epitome of power in the story. Like anytime we see a Shichibukai, we fear them. They are they are so imposing and so powerful. And now we have a Shichibukai that was once a slave to a celestial dragon. Which kind of elevates the celestial dragons to another level of villainy. Because you have the Shichibukai who have been sort of the big bads of many of the arcs. And now you have something that stands so far above them that they can enslave one of them. It's a horrifying and an incredibly dark story, too. People always talk about how goofy and childish One Piece is, but it's hard to look at One Piece the same after this backstory. I, you know, I, I still enjoy it for, like, the comedy and the lightheartedness, and that's never lost on me. And Oda still does a great job of balancing all that. But it's hard to read, read or watch this section and just consider One Piece as just this childish and goofy part. And I hate that it takes this long for, you know, the the people who are skeptical about One Piece being, like, super childish and not serious at all to kind of get this type of material. But, again, the wait is so worth it because it hits so much harder because of the sort of the lack of, of the seriousness sometimes of One Piece. But anyways, at just 12 years old, I mean, just children, the three of them were abducted and sold off into slavery to the Celestial Dragons. They don't say what specifically happened to them or what was done to them during this, but most adults can probably guess what kinds of unspeakable and horrible things were done to them, as this is a real-world horror that happens around the world, which is incredibly heartbreaking. And the way Sandra Sonia has this violent and visceral PTSD reaction just to the mere mention of this time period was really, like, eye-opening to see. With Luffy so concerned for them, he insists that she doesn't need to continue, but she continues anyways with the story. And I think there's also a small character moment that's not as apparent because I, I personally kind of also didn't see it the first few times I read and saw this, is Luffy telling them that they don't need to say anymore is kind of a significant moment in that, you know, they're explaining to him the justification for their questionable behavior up till now towards Luffy. But Luffy seeing how much 
pain this story causes reassures them that he doesn't need to hear any more explanation as to as to their actions, and he completely understands and forgives them for that. But yeah, they endured this hell for four years until a certain fisherman scaled the rock face of the red line all the way to Marie Joa, which I can't help but also think that you know that same thing it, it is what Luffy would do because. He pretty much did something very similar on drum to save Nami and Sanji, creating sort of another parallel between him and this fisherman who we learn was named Fisher Tiger. Like, <laughs> that is one of the coolest names in the entire series. And this man led the fisherman pirates. This man must have been one crazy strong guy if he fought off the celestial dragons and their forces, freed all the slaves. And he did it regardless of species or race, too. Despite the incredible racism directed at fishermen, especially by humans, he just wanted all the slaves to be free, it seems like. We then learn the significant origin of the sun brand on all the fishermen. It was a way to take back their agency and freedom, as well as the meaning behind the slave symbol, the symbol of the sun pirates. And Fisher Tiger, unfortunately, is said to be dead, which makes sense. Otherwise, Arlong and his crew would probably still be under him. And yeah, minor spoilers, but we will eventually go on to see this whole story from the perspective of Fisher Tiger much later on as well. Another thing I, th- I find interesting is the symbolism of the sun as the antithesis to slavery. Because, yeah, I think the sun symbolism is pretty apparent in One Piece. Like, if you watch almost every opening theme, it begins and ends with, like, a a dawn or, like, a sunrise. And so, yeah, I think the sun is very much tied to Luffy's sort of sense of freedom. And obviously, you know, dawn and the sun is always related to a new beginning. And so for these fishermen who lived as slaves... The sun basically symbolizes a new phase of their life away from slavery, which is definitely interesting for sure. Now, there's a lot more to the sun symbolism that we'll get into much later on in the series as well, because it does hold a pretty significant meaning, not just to the fishmen, but to the story of One Piece overall. The crazy thing about the Celestial Dragon's influence and power, too, when you think about it, despite how extremely rare and valuable devil fruits are to, like, almost everybody else on the planet, they just give these things away like they were candy to their slaves just to torture them for their own sick pleasure and entertainment. And there's a lot of, lot to dive deeper into this whole story and revelation, but I think the, the first question that Fisher Tiger's story it brings up is, you know, he seemed like an upstanding and good guy, and it's clear that Arlong, Hachi, Chu, and Kurobi were all part of the Sun Pirates, as the four of them all had that Sun Pirate brand somewhere on their body. So, like, what happened to Arlong that led led him on this dark path of becoming an evil pirate, like hell-bent on enslaving humans? And it'll be interesting to see if, if that gets explored as well. Also, it's not lost on me the irony of the Sun Pirates covering their past slave mark with something else because that is exactly what Arlong does to Nami. You know, she was forced to get the Arlong tattoo, but ultimately, to replace that permanent scar, she also covered it up with her now iconic tangerine and pinwheel tattoo. Again, reminding us that underlying theme and lesson of this kind of arc is that hate breeds hate while kindness creates more kindness. The other thing that's also hard not to notice is that Oda talks, it seems like discrimination, prejudice, and slavery is a very much huge topic in these arcs. First, we get from the point of view of racism and and discrimination from basically from the race point of view with Sabodi, with the fishmen and, and, and the mermen or the mermaids. But now he's taking it from another often oppressed and marginalized group of people, women, with Amazon Lily. And there has been this long standing history of women being thought of and used as objects and subjugated to often men in power throughout real world history. And yeah, this kind of brings that whole situation back, highlighting real world issues with racism and sexism. And also, this time he doesn't he's not really shy about it either because 
at least with Sabori and the Fishmen, they were seen as an allegory to racism. But this is just straight up humans, like human girls that were kidnapped. And so it's very much a direct correlation and representation. And so, yeah, he's getting a little bit more explicit about how he represents this stuff. In particular with Hancock, the idea that women are often forced to never show weakness or emotion, especially when in positions of power or just in day-to-day life, is also a real thing. And, you know, obviously I'm not a, I'm a woman nor pretend to know what it's like to live as a woman in the U.S. or Japan. But this is certainly something that I have heard talked about with my friends, and it's often a theme that's revisited in many other stories, both fiction and in nonfiction, and in real life. Like for Hancock, it's quite literally a survival mechanism. She can never let her guard down and never show any sign of vulnerability or weakness. Like It's really heartbreaking when you think about it because it it's heavily implied that she blames herself for what happened. And the way she speaks about this whole ordeal seems to imply that she feels personally responsible for what happened to her and her sisters for being too weak and vulnerable for them to get abducted like that. And that's obviously not true they they were victims they were freaking 12 like no one else is to blame but the celestial dragons and the people that abducted them but again it's it's she feels responsible for that and it's really sad but obviously it doesn't necessarily excuse hancock for for her behavior and her coldness to like to the point where she's like kicking kittens but you can kind of understand where she's coming from. But the point Oda is, I believe, trying to show is that the world government's tyranny stretches across all marginalized groups of people. And it's often these marginalized and underrepresented groups who are, you know, who have it, often have it worse than anyone. And Sabodi highlighted definitely injustices towards racial minorities, Amazon Lily towards women. And as we'll go on to see in the next arc, Oda will highlight one other group of people that are often marginalized, but we'll get to that in due time. But Oda is doing a pretty good job of getting us incredibly emotionally invested in hating the Celestial Dragons and the world government that allows them to do these horrific things to these people. One last thing I should probably mention that I've kind of neglected, but also intentionally haven't really talked about, but probably should have mentioned sooner. Because I wanted to wait till we got to Hancock's past reveal. It's not an understatement to say that there is some controversy in the fandom and by people in general with Boa Hancock as a character. Like many do love her as she consistently is in the top 15 of the Weekly Shonen Jump character popularity poll. And even sometimes cracking the top 10. But then there is a decent portion that find her problematic or downright hate her for a number of reasons like her appearance, her perceived lack of strength compared to the male Shibukai, the fact that her I- existing is kind of just, she's there because of, to serve as kind of a tokenism as the, the lone female Shibukai, and also one of the few female pirate captains in general. And so, yeah, there is definitely a lot of mixed opinions about Boa Hancock for sure. But I think the first thing I wanted to kind of preface all this and discuss is the overall treatment of women and and sort of the presence of sexism in shonen manga in, in general. Like shonen, the word means young boy in Japanese. So the target audience for a lot of these stories, is, and while many women enjoy many shonen manga and anime series, as evidenced by, so I was looking at my data and my audience seems to be slightly more skewed towards female audiences, which is very interesting over the last year. But yeah, it is It is still very much a male-oriented story being told by an author who is a cis male and has that perspective. But yeah, many women do enjoy One Piece and shonen manga and anime in general. You know, but this most shonen, if not all shonen series, have some level of sexism and also an issue with a lack of good female characters with depth. One Piece, I'd say, is not lacking in the latter as it does have a plethora of amazing female characters that are there to be more than just eye candy for its male viewers. However, the male gaze is very present, and even Oda kind of admits his pervy side in his SBS responses, although it's mostly said in a cheeky, you know, joking manner. 
But I've seen, I've certainly mentioned this many times how the fan service gets progressively worse in One Piece as it goes along the story with the, with the body proportions getting to absurd levels with the huge bust sizes and, and butts and tiny waists and culminating in sort of the epitome with Boa Hancock's design as that's the literal point of her character. While I do think it's a problem that almost all the women of One Piece, at least any that are the, you know, heroes or have any sort of prominence are goddess levels of beauty. And I don't necessarily have an issue with like just only beautiful women, but it's just Oda does at least give his female characters depth and purpose outside of just being eye candy or a romantic love interest. In fact, the irony of Hancock is almost like she's the antithesis to these tropes because she literally weaponizes male gaze and turns anyone to stone, whoever, uh, you know, ogles her. And I feel like she kind of bucks the, the trend of just sort of the romantic interest as well. I mean, to avoid spoilers for next episode, I'll, I'll just say the romantic side of Hancock can, I guess, be interpreted as problematic or disappointing to some, but I think it fits her character and says a lot about her based on what we learn of her from in these three episodes. And yeah, I, I, and I'll discuss this more in next in the next podcast when we get to those episodes. But Hancock is an incredibly layered character with quite a bit of depth in terms of her motivations, her actions, her backstory, and her power set as well. Also, the idea that in, in terms of her lacking strength, Hancock is not weak. Like, we haven't really seen her full capabilities yet. But she is incredibly strong, as we will go on to see. And she is not only one of the few female characters with Conqueror's Haki, she's one of the few people in general that possesses all three forms of Haki. And so, yeah, I think she also kind of bucks the trend in that. But but yeah, I, I can still see why people would have an issue with her. I personally, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think all the fan service in One Piece is kind of annoying at this point because it is distracting for sure. But I think with Boa Hancock, her design, I think, kind of fits her in terms of what she's doing. I mean, her whole power set is based on making people attracted to her. So there is that. Now, you could also argue that Oda created her that way. Like, he didn't have to give her that power set. Therefore, he didn't he wouldn't have to design her like that. But I mean, yeah, that that that's a whole other discussion that I don't really have time for right now. <laughs> I guess my point in in pointing this out here is that it's important to recognize that that these issues are present in manga and anime, and not just in One Piece, but in the entire industry. And that we as readers and viewers should think critically and call out some of the problematic parts of this piece of art that we do love and enjoy. As you know, I love One Piece to death. But I think we as fans have this problem where we kind of deify Oda because of his genius levels of creativity and storytelling. And I think we should stop that. Like, I don't do that, but I don't think Oda is infallible. And despite his genius, he can and should do better where he can. I think we should work to think critically when consuming his work and call him out when there is something problematic. And because this is primarily aimed at, aimed at young preteens, and teen boys, this can create some skewed and harmful impressions of what a woman should look like and how they should dress. And so it makes it all the more important to hold them and other mangaka to a higher standard in that regard. Now, to be fair, Oda does seem to try and learn from his past mistakes and continues to try and improve his female characters, at least within the story. Although I will say he gets even bolder with his over-the-top sexualization of the female characters. <laughs> But, you know, while the outrageous designs are completely on Oda, there is an aspect that is also on the anime. Because despite Oda designing these characters in very sexualized outfits, Toei is often the ones creating these incredibly questionable camera angles and weird shots that solely focus on boobs or butt shots that were never even remotely present in the manga. Or even, like, going as far as increasing the size of the breasts and even beyond Oda's already ridiculous like body proportions so yeah I think there is a bit of sort of industry pressure because yeah I mean at the end of the day sex sells and again I don't mind looking at like good-looking women but 
it's just like, I don't know. I feel like it takes away from the story, especially in One Piece. Especially when it's done to a ridiculous degree. Like, I like the fact that Nami is is very beautiful and she uses that to her advantage and it's part of her character. But at the same time, it's like, does she need to be walking around in like a bikini all the time? Like, I feel like that's not necessary. Anyways, back from that long tangent, Luffy will not only be able to get a ride from Hancock, but has also been invited to their banquet. And to Luffy's delight, obviously, because he gets to eat. But the only reason I bring this particular uh, scene up is because in Luffy's gratitude, we get a way deep cut callback to the end of Syrup Village in episode, I think, 16 or 17. Um, mind you, this is, again, this this moment is just completely lost in translation, but I'm referring to Luffy's grateful remark at how accommodating Hancock is being by providing him both with food and a ride. He says in the translation, I can't hardly believe it, and then gets corrected by Nyong Granny, don't you mean you can hardly believe it? Which, to be honest, doesn't really make sense in that context, but... In Japanese, he's saying a phrase, fundari kettari dana, which literally means stepped on and kicked, but essentially means uh, you've been struck with a string of bad luck, which is actually quite the opposite of obviously what's happening because he's mixing it up with another common Japanese idiom called itareri tsukuseri, which is referring to someone that went all out or there's nothing left to be desired. And the reason this is funny to me is because he made the exact same mistake with this exact phrase when Kaya offered them the going merry and then also offered to stock it full of food and supplies as well. And what's crazier is that this was added just for the anime. So it wasn't even Oda, but instead someone at the studio remembered this deep cut joke and decided to throw throw it in as this would have been a perfect situation for that callback. And I absolutely loved hearing it. Just to quickly touch up on the party scene, I always admired Luffy's ability to turn a tense situation into a party and be the life of the party. The part where, you know, one of the Amazons has created a sideshow where she's charging people for the chance to touch Luffy's rubber body, I always crack up as well. But eventually that causes a commotion and Luffy has to try and escape because he doesn't want to be touched anymore, which is is an interesting reversal in... Because in general, you know, women are often the ones being groped and stuff. But this time, a bunch of women are groping Luffy, which is kind of an interesting and funny reversal of that. But yeah, Margaret helps Luffy escape the hordes of fans and they go to Nyong Granny's. And another awesome joke that I I love is how Luffy, given Nyong Granny's sort of small stature nicknames her mame basa or bean granny but what gets me every time is how she talks normal for a little while longer and then has that sudden tsukomi joke where she angrily yells out did you just call me bean (laughs) it's so funny and um also another fun thing about young granny that kind of gets lost in translation with her is that her speech pattern has a very funny quirk that matches her name so most of the time when she says a word that begins or ends with a N sounding syllable, she replaces it with her name or a variation of it. And it's pretty it's it's pretty entertaining if you kind of pay attention to it. So for example, like take the question what's happening? Normally in, in Japanese it would be something like Doshtano. But Nyong Granny would replace that no at the end, which is used to emphasize sort of the inquisitive nature of the question. But she'll replace it with nyo or nyong. So like her version would be doshita nyong. And and it's not a huge thing that changes anything. But I just thought I would point it out. Because if you listen for it, it's pretty much in almost everything she says. I think the only time it doesn't appear is when she's talking about a serious thing. That's It, it seems to disappear, like particularly when she's trying to have like a heart-to-heart with um, Hancock or when she's talking about Ace's execution. I don't think it appears there. I'd have to go back and read every line of dialogue, but I'm pretty sure that it's missing during those portions. Now, obviously, speaking of Ace, the last thing we want to go over since this episode is getting really long is, of course, Luffy learning of Ace's execution and his decision to forego reuniting with his crew to take a detour to save Ace from the Marine Maximum Security Prison impelled down. 
And this is really significant. I remember at the time thinking, oh, crap, like, Luffy is going to continue more of the story without his crew. And I was a little hesitant about this, as I love the entire crew and that dynamic that they have. And having them there is one of the best parts of One Piece. But I also was incredibly intrigued by this major shakeup in the formula to have Luffy continue his journey with a whole new set of temporary allies and and potentially go up against the most difficult obstacle of the series yet without the help of his crew. Like, how is that going to work? And yeah, I mean, kind of a bit of spoilers, but it doesn't disappoint as it leads to the arc that is, in fact, considered by many as one of their, if not their favorite arc in this entire series. Sort of the culminating arc of this story usually ranks up with Water 7 and Alabasta. Now, for me, Water 7 and Alabasta are probably still up there above this upcoming arc, but damn, it's really close. Like, it, it's it's really up there in terms of what we're in for. I mean, if you know, you know why it's so good. But yeah, with that said, the, the episode ends on a cliffhanger of Hancock falling ill to some unknown illness, but... Yeah, we'll have to wait till the next podcast to discuss what all of that is about. And so, yeah, I mean, this was definitely a dense and heavy podcast for for a little bit. And yeah, I tried to do my best to talk about some some more heavier stuff and and, and all that. I'm no, obviously, I'm not like an expert on any of that, but just kind of like trying to give my personal take on on sort of the bigger things around One Piece and its story. Anyways, if you did enjoy this, send me a like or comment. And if you want to join me on this journey of rewatching One Piece, please consider subscribing. Check out my Instagram and I guess now X account because Twitter, Elon changed the name of Twitter. So, but anyways, uh, it's still at Sunny Go Podcast if you want updates of when I post new episodes or see some pictures of my manga collection. Check those out. And as always, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to listen to my podcast. Yeah, this one kind of ran really long, so I'm just going to stay away from a spoiler section, even though there are maybe a couple things, but I can always bring those up in, in later episodes. So yeah, stay safe out there, and I hope to see you on the next episode. Bye.